In this episode, we jump clear across the pond to the UK where an all-electric Zenith is being built. All right, everybody, welcome to the Experimental Aircraft Channel, and we are jumping all the way across the pond today to talk about some really cool stuff with electric powered aircraft. So Tim, go ahead and introduce yourself and where you are in the world. Uh, good afternoon, Brian and uh, the Experimental Aircraft Channel at large. Um, we are in Norfolk, old Norfolk in England. Uh, we're based at Old Buckingham Airfield specifically. Um, it's one of the, this part of the world is littered with old US Air Force and USAAF bomber bases, and it's now been repurposed as a nice little airfield, and that's where we're based. Awesome, awesome. And this project that you have going on is a Zenith cruiser, and I have kind of personal interest in that because I am also building a Zenith cruiser. Um, but tell, me, tell us a little bit about the project itself and how the idea came up to make it an all electric airplane. Uh, right. Um, it is, as you say, a mostly standard uh, cruiser. Uh, it's got the big tires. It's got the stole landing gear on it. But other than that, it's a fairly standard cruiser. Um, we decided to develop an electric power plant for the cruiser uh, because it fits a, what we think is a real world use that electric aircraft can have right now with current technology. Um, obviously, yeah, it won't have the range of a, a bespoke electric aircraft with a really yeah, aerodynamically slippery airframe. It won't be as fast as the things like Rolls-Royce are building. But what it will be, as you'll know, because you're building one, is quite easy to build, quite quick to build, rugged, good short field performance. And those things, combined with the ability to charge your electric batteries off-grid, out in the wild, so to speak, means that there's a real use case for them in delivering medicines and aid in remote, remote parts of the world where you know they don't even have roads that keep working when it rains. And in sure. that context, the limited range is less of a problem because you know, there's a billion people in the world who have to walk 25, 30 miles to get to a doctor. So talk to us about the, the motor tech on this real quick. Um, what, if you're at liberty to say, what brand of motor is it? What horsepower? Or I guess it's measured differently in electric. Um, um, but uh, discuss the motor for a minute. Yeah, the, the motor is, uh, it's out of Slovenia. It's an MRAX motor. It's the same technology that Pipistrel use in their certified electric trainer. Um, because we're taking the path of least resistance here. where We're demonstrating how easily it can be done, really. So we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, we've tested a couple of other motors, but they're a bit hush-hush at the moment, to be honest. Uh, the, the motor we're going with, it's broadly designed to be a direct replacement for a 100-horsepower motor like the Zenith was designed for. So, you know, the, the drawings for the CH750 show a Continental O200 on the standard Correct. plans. Correct, yeah. So we, we've designed the firewall forward package, so it's got essentially the same rev range, slightly better torque output, slightly better power output, but the same weight and the same center of mass as an O200. Yeah, I know there's uh, discussions about, people talk about horsepower and then they talk about torque and then others say that they're one and the same, just you're, you're given different uh, measurements, <laughs> right? But you do have more torque with this application, do you not? And is it uh, equal we, to a horsepower? Uh, we, we do have, the, the torque is limited in the software because otherwise you start bending things. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the motor will put out, um, I, I naturally think in, in metric, so you'll have to excuse me if there's rounding errors, but it's about 380 something foot pound peak okay. output. Okay. But obviously we, we don't need that. We're, we're running, you know, 180 odd, just so we can confidently say we're exceeding what an O200 would do. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you right here and just have to ask this question since we're talking about horsepower and torque. And I just came back from several different uh, competitions and I know there's a big one coming up. Obviously, we wouldn't have an hour 
range with this, but if you wanted to spool this thing up to max torque and, and practically <laughs> snap off your, uh, your engine, your motor mount, excuse me, um, could you take this to High Sierra maybe and show up and do a little bit of stall drags well, with an electric? Well, maybe you could, because the I mean, thing is with, um, obviously with a piston engine, the, the limiting factor on the rev ceiling is inertial loads in the con rods, mostly. Yeah. Um, after that, I guess you've got cylinder head temperature and you're going to start blowing holes in your pistons, things like that. With an electric motor, it's, it's almost all thermal. It's how much heat you can get out of the motor. Okay. So the motor we're using will put out 350 horsepower. Yeah. But you're dancing with the devil there. <laughs> yeah. You just won't get the heat out of it fast enough. Um, but oh, you yeah, we could do some uh, liquid cooling, right? Instead of uh, yeah, air cooling. Yeah, no, we're, no, we're liquid cooled on the motor and anyway. the motor controller. Okay. Um, so we're already liquid cooled. And one of the ways that we're, we're getting a slightly higher takeoff power than Pipistrel do in the certified one is we've got a slightly heavier cooling system, essentially. So we've got more thermal inertia in the system than they have. And at the moment, everything on the airframe is slightly on pause because we're getting on with the off-grid charging system, ready for the, the big air show we've got at the end of the month. Just so to, to speaking of charging, let's, let's roll into the battery tech uh, for a minute, battery tech talk. Uh, what kind of batteries, I assume they're lithium, um, but yes. what, what type of battery and what, what does it take to charge and what voltage um, do you have to charge at or amp do you have to charge at and that kind of stuff? How much do they weigh? In, yeah, in, in, the, in the first version, uh, we're using an 18650 cell. So it's the same cell technology that Tesla used to use before they went to a, a larger format. Um, and again, that, that was a selection based on the idea that it's good enough to demonstrate the principle now. And we know that technology is only getting better. So, you know, by the time we've finished our test program, most of the major automotive OEMs will have solid state batteries in production and we can pivot to that. Um, so the, the aircraft is, it's a modular battery system. Ours has six modules in it at the moment, which allows you to still have two, uh, a pilot and a passenger. You can, if your real world use case is you know, a, a medic or a midwife, then you can sack the uh, right hand seat and fit two more battery modules and extend extend your range um the ground power systems use normal lead acid batteries because there's no point spending the money on lithium technology if what you're doing is trickle charging off solar and then just dumping that energy into the plane when you need to recharge so yeah lith uh, lithium iron in the plane lead acid on the ground um, in terms of charging uh, there's there's two different options. The one we're using at the moment is a, a single phase uh, 230 volt. So I guess that would be split phase for a lot of you guys because you do two, two 110s, don't you? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll, you know, 230 for us, it's a 20 amp charger nominally. And that, that's you also it. have over there, I'm not sure in your your household, but don't you have like 600 volt in your wall right now or something crazy? Uh, well, we, we, uh, it's three phase. So it's 415 phase oh, to phase. Sorry. Um, <laughs> It'll still kill no, you. No, if you go to plug in your lamp and you hold the, the electrode the wrong way, right? <laughs> well, to be honest, no, you, it, it's the 400 volt DC you want to worry about. Now let me introduce you to our sponsors that make all this possible. Awesome companies like Dynon Avionics, AirTech Coatings, AV Nation and Airworks. Check the description below this video for links to these great companies. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. If you like these videos that we are producing weekly, Give that like button a click and engage all notifications so you don't miss a single episode. Mm. That, that, that's, that, that'll really tickle you. Um, it's unfair. I mean, the, the battery system we've got, has got a potential fault current of about 1800 amps at okay. 400 volts. Okay. So, well, um, while we're talking about batteries, let, let's get mm. the elephant out of the room, right? And obviously we, you just mentioned heat and dissipating heat. So how do you how do you make this? And this came up with you know hydrogen um, cells you know for cars. But how do you keep this thing getting too hot too fast and 
exploding or having some type of arc flash <laughs> by something that wasn't uh, insulated properly? Like, how, how, yeah. how um, do you build in the safety to keep there, that from happening? Yeah, there's a whole series of mitigations. Um, and off the top of my head, I might not put, put them in the most sensible order. But, um, I mean, primarily, the, the ways you stop lithium batteries going badly wrong is you stop them getting hot in the first place and you stop mechanical failures that lead to shorts within the battery pack. Um, in terms of the, the heating, the way our system is designed, things, if you just decide to have a, a, a dumb moment, smash the throttle forward and just wait to see what happens, things heat up in an order which means they fail safely. So the motor will overheat before the speed controller, which will overheat before the bus cables, which will overheat before the battery. So spinning things will fail and stop pulling current before the batteries overheat anyway. And that, that's just built into the battery architecture. Um, there's also uh, every battery module has its own monitoring uh, card in it as part of the battery, mo the, uh, the BMS system. So there's, there's three temperature sensors in every battery pack. There's, so there's 18 of them distributed around the airframe. Uh, they all have redundant comms. Uh, so, and they all should read what is essentially the same temperature. So you've got an awful lot of monitoring going on, all of which would have to fail for you to get to the stage where the battery pack would get into a thermal runaway regime. So what is the infrastructure on the ground? Because again, you have an hour uh, limitation and how are you going to set these up uh, across uh, the countryside or whatnot? Well, there's, there's two different models there, really. Uh, the one we're now working on at Old Buckingham is sort of uh, the, the, the home base, if you like. Um, it's got enough solar panels on it so you can, in summer, you'd get three, maybe four flights a day in terms of energy harvested off the solar panels. Um, and that, that's big enough to essentially be a small hangar. So the, the tail sticks out, but the wings, the cockpit and everything is all under the shelter. So what we call um, here in the States is a shade port, essentially. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what you'd have if you were a flight school who wanted one of these. So, you know, you could do two or three, maybe four lessons or leisure flights a day and never have to pay a fuel bill which would be nice. Um, but out in the real world where the, the job that we think these can do is things like medical resupply of, you know, village clinics and things of that nature, you would tend to modify existing microgrids because that's how rural energy is done these days anyway, in a lot of the world. So you've got a few solar panels that essentially trickle charge a ground battery and all you have to do to make those compatible with our aircraft is fit a few more batteries, modify the controls a little bit and leave a charger on the ground. So the existing infrastructure just gets slightly modified so you can land, plug in and off you go. And that's a sort of model where if you're going to one of those sites every week, whether it's a clinic or your hunting cabin makes no odds, really, you have a small generator, which trickle charges a ground power battery, which can be big and heavy and low tech. Um, and then you just yeah, use a normal charger to get the power from that battery into the plane. What everybody is curious about, I'm sure, I, I don't know, we've got some video that we've shared with uh, some ground testing. Uh, when is the scheduled first flight? I mean, it's, it's not gonna happen on a day probably, but when do you think it may happen? Um, the, well, uh, we, we're now at this. We're now at the stage where it's mostly about getting the paperwork in order, which is a little more complicated over here than it is on your side of the pond. I think. Well, apparently uh, it's complicated here too. People are waiting on the FAA to get into the air here too. So. Uh, oh well, welcome to our world. Okay. Um, <laughs> but no, we're we're aiming for late August. I'll I'll take mid September. Okay. Well, I will definitely check in with you and. Uh, be able to hopefully you know share that that experience from the first flight and what you get back from that yeah i hope so we'll we'll keep you in the loop 
and uh, well, th thanks for spreading the word. Eh? Yeah, yeah. So if people wanted to follow you on their own, where are you at on social and then Nuncats? Explain that. Um, where at? Well, uh, fa Facebook and Instagram are probably the, the best places to, to watch the, the build and the testing of the, the aircraft. Um, that's just Nuncats on both those platforms. Uh, Twitter is where you can see more of the sort of social impact side of things. Uh, it's a bit more grown up. My wife runs that. Um, <laughs> um, other than that, we do have a website. It's nuncats.org. Uh, there's not very much on it. So you're better off just looking at Facebook, probably. And uh, once we've got the cowls on it and we start doing a lot more taxi testing, we'll start putting out some content on, uh, on a YouTube channel, which is going to be up and running fairly shortly. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for taking the time to share this with us today. Everybody, thank you for joining in. Um, thanks for supporting this channel. If you have, haven't subscribed yet, I, I don't know why, but let this be an invitation right now. And if you like this video, give it a like and we'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching this week's episode. Remember to rivet down that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit all the bell notifications so you don't miss a single episode. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.